All right, and we will get started. Uh, good evening. I'm Sarah Kravitz. I'm the chair of the Boston Beck, and thank you for attending our first presentation in 2022. We have quite the lineup of presentations this year that we are excited to update you on as we finalize all of our plans. So um, I invite you to join our LinkedIn page for um, event updates, or also sign up for the BSA notifications on their website. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few general announcements and housekeeping items. I would like to congratulate Stephen Holland for being elected the future chair elect. He will take over the chair position in September. Stephen is an enclosure consultant at La Measure Boston office and also achieved his PE license in 2021. We're really glad to have someone with such experience on board. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Looking forward to it. And I would also like to welcome Ryan Owell, our new board member. Ryan has been the director at Envelope LLC for the past seven years and has over 20 years of experience in the field of architectural design and construction. He's a go-to resource to help support architects and contractors in New England relative to design, procurement, installation of all building and closure solutions. So if you have any questions about products, I would recommend reaching out to him. Welcome, Ryan. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for your efforts and time. The Boston Beck really appreciates your involvement. Now, a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat and we can go over them at the end. Also, if you'd like to receive uh, AIA credits, please use the link in the chat to fill out your information. Um, I'll post this at the end as well. Let me just do that now. Bear with me. And with that, I would like to thank our presenter, Len Anastasi. Len has worked in the construction industry for over 40 years in masonry, waterproofing, restoration work. <laughs> he has quite the resume and involvement. He currently owns Exotech Manufacturing Inc., which manufactures specialty construction products and Exotech Consulting, which performs consulting services on building and closure items and issues. He's also a member of ASTM's E06 Committee on Building Performance, uh, Boston Society of Architects Building and Closure Council, where he's presented several topics. And after today, this will be another one to the books. He's also a founding member and past president and director of the Air Barrier Association of America. He is currently chairman of the ABBA Conference Committee, a member of the Marketing Committee, Technical Committee, and Research Committee. Uh, and he's also a chair for the ADHOC Committee for Technical Notes. Uh, in addition to that, he's a member of the Construction Specifications Institute. And uh, in the past, he was a Northeast, Northeast Region President of the CSI and Director of the Boston Chapter of the CSI. So thank you, Len. We really appreciate your time um, and sharing your experience on today's topic, Three Failures and a Save. So with that, I give you the floor. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for inviting me. And thank you, everybody, for, for accepting me and, and, um, and deciding to attend. I see some old friends um, on here. Hi, Scott Winkler. Hi, Ted George. Um, they've, they've been involved with the Building Closure Council for a while. So, um, so basically what I want to do with this presentation is, is we're going to take a look at three buildings that had major failures, you know, pretty, pretty, made, pretty good sized failures. And we're going to take a look at why they happen so they can be avoided in the future. And then I'm going to, we're going to look at a building where the, the design was destined to fail just because of the nature of the building. But the, the um, building team wasn't quite aware of that. And when I pointed it out, uh, it was kind of a jaw-dropping experience for them um, You know, what, when I showed them what was going to happen. So I put this all in a presentation, and I hope it helps. I hope everybody gets something, at least something out of it. So uh, Sarah pointed out you will get AIA CES credits for this through the B Building Closure Council. Um, our, our learning objectives for the presentation are we want to learn the importance of proper moisture management in the building. Um, learn about some pitfalls to avoid in, in, in moisture management. 
uh, how important coordination is in the success of a project and learn how important supervision is in the success of a project. So first one we're gonna take a look at, I'm sure a lot of people know what this building is. <laughs> um, I won't name it by name, um, uh, but it, it was, let's look at the, the, uh, the problems where we had a multitude of leaks through the above grade building, um, vertical uh, building enclosure system. And the results were damage to the building enclosure components and damage in some of the units. Uh, some of the problems we had was there's water leakage through the existing windows, uh, water leakage into the light gauge metal framing stud cavity, water leakage into the condo units. Um, the, I think I pointed out a structural code issue to the law firm that I was an expert witness for, and they said, don't use that. Because uh, that, if you point that out, then the whole case blows up and everybody gets blown up on this. So, but the background of the building is that it was built in the late 1980s and it had an Eves veneer. Um, the building was leaking from day one. Uh, they threw it together really fast, trying to beat the winter. It was just before we had that big um, recession in the late 80, 80s, you know, due to the, the SNL. Um, lending policies there. Um, so, and the developer was trying to get it built in time, you know, get it built before every, everything hit. It was repaired and reclad in 2006 with an ACM panel veneer. Uh, the architect did a great job. The building looks beautiful. I like the lines and everything, but they had an issue on it there. I'm, I'm gonna show you what that was. Um, one, of the, one of the issues was the existing windows, the trocal windows were, ter were determined a leak by many consultants that had looked at it. Uh, but when it, the numbers came in for the for the recladding, uh, it was over budget and the board of directors said, we're not going to replace the windows because it's too expensive. One of the reasons were the interior finishes. A lot of people had very expensive wallpaper or other interior finishes around the window and that would get destroyed when, if the windows were removed um, and, and they'd have to re-wallpaper the whole wall or do some other other repairs inside so um they decided not to do it um and then after all these repairs were done and recladding the building leaked even worse which was a shame uh we're going to take a look at why that happened so the design team actually did a a, a wolfy analysis on it, which is a hydrothermal analysis i believe everybody's familiar with this program if, if you're on the building enclosure council so they, they had run it here. And basically when, when they did the repair, they had a, a rain screen cladding system. Uh, and the, the, the consultant for the design team correctly said, you know, originally they had a sealed system and he correctly said, you got to open that system up. You can't have a sealed system here. Um, it's gonna, you're gonna create uh, two vapor barriers with the potential of water getting in between the two vapor barriers. So they went to a back drain, back vented system um, and the way you simulate that in Wolfie is you basically just leave it off. There's one way to do it. You can leave it off and turn off the rain, rainwater absorption. Uh, so it doesn't let any rainwater water hit, hit the other components of it. Uh, or you can put like a roofing membrane in front of it and then do a certain amount of air changes per hour behind it. But there's always that argument of how many air, air changes per hour are you going to get? So I, when I ran it, I did it with, without the, the cladding system in place. So, so they had basically an inch and a half of extruded polystyrene. Um, this was the design. They had a vapor permeable air and water barrier. They had gypsum sheathing and they had uh, low density fiberglass bats insulation. Now at the time, the code said you only need inch and a half rigid insulation on the studs. And you, you, would, you would meet the building code for your insulation, but the consultant said, Wow, you know, they've had EFS insulation outside and they've had BATS insulation in the stud cavity for years. And if we only do the inch and a half outside, we may have a, you know, a cold issue you know, or, or an energy consumption issue. So we might as well do this. And they correctly said, you know, anything that, so because the, the, the vapor barrier had to be on the winter warm side of the insulation, it went right here, uh, you know, right against the, um, the backside of the interior gypsum wallboard or the outside of the, the, the interior gypsum wallboard. And then the code said anything to the exterior of that had to have a, a, the, had to have a perm rating 10 times higher. So they complied with the code. They ran an analysis on this and it worked. We took look at total moisture content in the, the structure looked fine. Uh, we look at 
you know, water content of our gypsum board. The, the extruded polystyrene, no big deal. That can get wet and it'll dry out, but you can see there was no big problems with that. The gypsum board, the, the gypsum sheathing was what I was worried about in this. And that looked fine. It starts, we start this at the, at the moisture content, water content that it would be at 80% relative humidity to, you know, to simulate you know, the, the completion of and construction of, and ready to turn that building over. And then we look at what happened. So everything looked good here. Um, your your um, interior gypsum board looked good. We knew it would because we had the vapor retarder. Um, when we look at the monitor positions, which are, it's one, two, and three here. So, or, or it's two, three, and four, which is, this is my concern. I wasn't concerned out here, but two, three, and four, your three monitor positions, um, you look, Come on, come on. So it, one. so this is monitor position one is, is or I'm, I'm sorry, two and three here. And that stayed well below the 75% relative humidity. You know, one of the failure criteria we came up with at ASTM, and then we turned that all over to ASHRAE 160. Um, th that, uh, that committee there, that task group, and was that you don't want to get above 80% relative humidity in the light gauge metal framing cavity for more than, you know, for, you don't want to get above 80% for extended periods of time. So it's above 80%, that's when metal starts to corrode. And we can see, you know, looking at the relative humidity, oh, I'm sorry, I had them backwards. The exterior surface was fine. This was the um, um, low density fiberglass insulation inside here. So it met the code and it looked like it was going to work, but it failed. So we got to figure out why. Um, so looking at some of the problems of the building, that's the general things. When I walked around, there was a two level parking garage located e under each of those two buildings and they were not decoupled from the building. So whenever your uh, CO2 exhaust fans kicked in, it's gonna be sucking air out of the building through the bottom of the building. Um, you know, the garage, like I said, they had uh, the, the, the CO2 garage um, fans would, would suck air out of the building because uh, they weren't decoupled. Um, the common area pressurization system for the building were deactivate, deactivated. And I asked the maintenance people, I said, well, why? And they said, well, it never worked right, so we just turned it off. Now, that is a life safety issue. I pointed that out to them, but they were like, well, if it doesn't work, why not? So there weren't any vestibules at the elevator lobbies. And the building was experiencing significant depressurization in the common areas. And that was due to the you know, stack effect of, of, of the, the um, elevator shafts and uh, a source of air coming into the building at the, at the garage levels there because it wasn't decoupled. So, um, so we take a look at after they did the, um, the, the, the ACM panel veneer and it leaked and they had problems, they started taking it off to try to find what was going on. And so what they did is instead of Z furring, there was an issue where the studs were supposed to be, they thought they were 20 gauge or 18 gauge and they found out they were 20. So the structural engineer, which was the engineer for the metal panel contractor, that was another issue, but they came up with just putting flat plate on the building. Um, just, and you can see these flat plates just screwed through. And, and one of the issues I had with that is by doing this, you turn, the rigid insulation, extruded polystyrene insulation into a load bearing member, which in a non-combustible building, that's against the code. So that was a code issue that I threw out there and nobody else mentioned it, uh, but the attorney, um, the, the law firm I was working for said, if everybody mentions that, everybody in their contract is responsible for meeting code and we all get blown up on this one. So don't say anything. <laughs> so, um, so what happened was when they were, when they were trying to find the studs, you can see here, you'll see like three of those screws with the basket to try to fasten the insulation. And then again, to try to fasten this metal, you can imagine they missed the stud. And so they had these little holes every once in a while. And they determined that there was like one eighth inch hole for a screw about every 16 square feet. So every four foot by four foot, there was a miss and everybody went, aha, we found the problem. That's why water's leaking into the building. It's all this guy's fault. Uh, he didn't do it right, you know, case done. Well, 
you can actually simulate a leak with Woofy. So what I did is I, I simulated a leak through the extruded polystyrene, through the vapor retarder, the, 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 which was the, um, the vapor permeable uh, air and water barrier and through the sheathing and into this space here. And what you do is just calculate the diameter of a hole versus 16 square feet uh, and put that percentage in and you build the leak in. And you can see here's my sources, source one, source two. It's through the extruded polystyrene vapor barrier gypsum board. And when I looked at it, here's the, here's the uh, moisture content, total moisture content with the leak and without the leak. I didn't really and see I'm any difference. Sorry to interrupt you. I just have one question. Um, what type of material was the uh, vapor barrier? It was a fluid applied vapor permeable air and water barrier. Okay, thank you. You'll see pictures of it. I won't say the manufacturer because it wasn't their fault. They shouldn't be blamed. All right, that, so. <laughs> my question was, what is the air barrier, not the vapor barrier? Sorry, Greta. And oh, hi, Greta. Hi. <laughs> it's it's um, a vapor permeable fluid applied air and water barrier. All right, so now we look at moisture, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the uh, water content of the gypsum board with the, no, I can't see at the top here. Let's see if I can move this, there it is. You know, with the leak, without the leak, they look pretty similar here, All right? And take a look at um, the interior wall board. They look pretty similar. So, I don't think that that causes a problem. Then when we look at the monitor positions, monitor position two uh, looks fine. Monitor position three and four look fine too, the, the, the RH levels there. So I don't think it was that. So, but what we're finding is, here's your fluid applied vapor permeable air and water barrier. What we're finding is wherever they did um, the peel and stick, um, uh, transition membranes, inside corner, outside corner, around steel beams, around penetrations, that was becoming unadhered. And there had been a, a worker out there on time and material for, for 18 months. And all he did was go around and patch the leaks. And he happened to work for me years ago. So I knew him and I said, can I ask you a question? Sure. Have you had to go back and patch leaks you patched a year ago? He goes, yeah. Why'd you ask that? I said, that's all. I just wanted to know. So I knew there was some other mechanism there creating the failure. And I knew the failure isn't gonna be through this, the, the field of the membrane. But what gave, some of the things that gave me away is I'm seeing rust spots coming through this vapor permeable air barrier. So there's high humidity behind that vapor permeable air barrier. We look at some of the, you know, the details around like the, these vents and everything that self-adhering membrane was coming off. Um, you know, and I'm looking at the, the other thing I notice is there's a lot of corrosion on this metal already, and it's not that old. You know that um, it, it shouldn't be showing this much. Um, the, and this is, is this is corrosion of the sacrificial coating. It shouldn't be showing this much at this point. So there's a couple. So the first thing I did is they must have real high humidity in there. So I took a look at the one of the ACM panels, and, and so they were venting it through weep holes. So I picked it up and that, that's me holding up. I says, oh, there's our weep hole in the ACM. Uh, let's take a look inside and see where the weep hole is for the, um, for the stiffener plate that they use to, to stiffen that so it can take the wind load. And as you can see where the writing is here, that doesn't match up with the weep hole there. Now you have about a 16th of an inch air space between the two, uh, but in the head of water will push water out the weep hole, but when you don't have a head of water, the water's gonna sit there and the water is a really good vapor barrier. So that's why we were getting this premature um, um, corrosion of, of the metal items inside that cavity. It's because it really was invented because the water was, that would sit in there was preventing it from being vented because the weep holes didn't line up. So, but we still didn't solve the, the leak inside the building you know, the leaks that were inside the building, the stud cavity and whatnot, what was causing those, the self-adhering membrane to, to fall apart. So when I took a look at one of the windows, you can barely see it here. They actually did build a, 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 a windowsill flashing pan and they jammed it up under the window and tried to caulk it all up, but it's flashed to leak behind the extruded polystyrene. And I said, aha, 
I think this is the problem right here because these windows leak pretty darn bad. They're approved to leak pretty darn bad, but as I said, by a lot of consultants, but they figured if they could catch all that water and get it out to outside of the building instead of letting it go inside the units that they would solve the problem well enough, but they're dumping it down in behind the, the, the extruded polystyrene insulation and every two floors, they put what they call their kick out flashing. So I looked at that and said, well, um, Water has both cohesive and adhesive properties, so it's going to adhere to surfaces and it's also going to span gaps and stay there. And where's it going to dry to? You have a vape, you got um, rigid insulation at one inch and a half, which is about 0.75 perms. You got a, a 10 perm air uh, vapor permeable air and water barrier and, and behind that. And then you got the, the sheathing, which is 42 perms, and then bats insulation, which is like 240 perms and then a vapor barrier. So that's gonna dry into the stud cavity and that's the problem. Some of the other problems we saw is like, uh, I noticed this, this was a stairway that's supposed to be positively pressurized, but look at all the dirt coming out of the garage because it's negatively pressurized and it's sucking air out of the garage up into a stairway, which is a, a bad thing if, if there's a fire going on because the stairways are supposed to be positively pressurized to push the smoke out so people can get out instead of negatively pressurized to, to draw the smoke in. So let's take a look at, let's use the Wolfie program to account for the windowsill flashing dump in the water behind the XPS. The first question is how much water gets in there? We really don't know. I was just gonna take a guess, but if you tell a lawyer, you're gonna take a guess at it, they're gonna tell you, you can't use that in a court of law because the other lawyer will, will eat you up. So I was racking my brain trying to figure something out. Is there some way we can do a mock-up and measure the amount of water and, and have that as, as something that we could submit as evidence. And you know, the only thing he could really do is go out in a rainstorm day after day after day for a whole year and measure all the water that gets in and comes out and you know, measure everything you can. But my saving grace was actually a standard I mentioned earlier, actually standard 160. At the time, it was actually standard 160P. And a friend of mine, Anton Twinwaldi, had worked, put a lot of hours into it. He worked for U.S. Forest Products Laboratory. I met him through ASTM. And he put in a stipulation that says that exterior wall has to work even if 1% of the water that hits the the gladding system gets to your water resistive barrier. And I was like, 1%, that's the only thing I had in print. He said, 1%, I don't think that's gonna make a difference, but let me run it anyways. So I did, total water content structure. This is a disaster. Remember the other ones were very low? This, is, this was a disaster. Now let's look at extruded polystyrene water content. Look at that, this is a disaster. Your gypsum board water content, it's going up year after year after year. Now, what is your detail membrane stuck to? Your gypsum board. We do know that after once, once, your, once a substrate gets to a certain moisture content, whatever's stuck to it's not going to stay stuck to it anymore. Think of your wallpaper in your bathroom. Why does your wallpaper only peel in your bathroom? Because your gypsum board gets a high enough um, interior gypsum wallboard gets a high enough water content, it doesn't stay stuck. The same thing happens with peel and stick membranes. So if we look at monitor position two, it starts at 80%, it's up in the high 90%. So this is what was happening. That substrate got so wet that all the detail membrane around beams and penetrations and windows and, and, and whatnot started falling off. And that's what was causing the leaks. So you can see monitor position three and four, which is the middle of the bats insulation, then up against um, the, in, the interior um, vapor barrier, which what it was, what they did is they took out the old bats insulation and stuck new foil face bats insulation in there. So um, this was what caused the problem. So how do we fix this? They, unfortunately, they have to take it all apart again. So to meet code now, all you need is two, two and a quarter inches of extruded polystyrene on that exterior instead of the inch and a half, uh, do an air water and vapor barrier on the sheathing and leave that stud cavity empty. No vapor barrier in here because you got a vapor barrier here. So let's take a look at how that works. Look at our total moisture water content. It goes back down to a very reasonable level. Our gypsum board, um, water content in the gypsum board 
comes down and, and just it cycles through the seasons. This is over a five year period I ran it and you can see it's cycling, but it's at very acceptable levels. Um, interior wall board, very acceptable. Gypsum board is at very acceptable levels. And look at our monitor position too now, which we're up around the 95 to, to 99%. You know, it drops from 80 and it's cycling between say 30 and, and 60 here, which is fine. Um, and then three and four, same thing. So a simple, something that simple would have saved this disaster. And it's unfortunately, it's still sitting there. They, they don't, they haven't fixed it yet. Um, it's, I think it's a money issue. This was, I don't know if anybody out there has done uh, expert witness work, but um, it's the best way I can explain it is the lawyers are trying to grab a thread and unravel the sweater in, in front of a jury or in front of a judge. And your guy's not always lily white. Your guy, he's always did something wrong. This is out of, I don't know, probably 20 expert witness cases I've done. I was so confident in this one. I couldn't wait to get on the witness stand and it settled on the Friday before we're supposed to start trial. So they got some money, but it wasn't, it's not near enough to fix it. And I feel bad for the condo owners are still sitting there. The next one I wanna look at, so I'm gonna call, I call it the apartment building here. Um, they had a lot of problems with this and the building wasn't even that old. Most of the problems were behind this thin stone veneer. There's a few issues around windows, um, but it was, it was limited to just around the windows, but I'm gonna stick with what happened behind the stone veneer because you people all, if you, if you saw a window come out here and saw what they did for flashing, you go, yeah, that's, they just didn't flash it right. Um, and, but what they did is they had a superintendent from down south, you know, in Texas, way down south in Texas, where they get about, I don't know, two inches of water a year. And he was telling them, this is how you do it. And this is how you flash it. And we're going to do it my way. And so uh, he just didn't understand building science and physics and you know how to build in a wet, cold environment. So the problems was they had multiple water leaks through the above grade building enclosure system. And, and again, there was water damage to the building components. So the background of the building was built in 2006. The architect had one design. This is, this is what they call uh, garden style apartments. And this developer was building these all over the country with the exact same design. Um, they hired an architect to design the building for what it looks like. They decided what the materials were. The developer did uh, what, what was going to be used and, and basically what was the specifications. And they had the same thing in any environment. So the developer was also the contractor too. And the, like I said, the, the superintendent, they trusted him to do all the waterproofing details on the project. Um, so by 2012, when they were having issues and we started to take this thing apart, the OSB was completely rotted out. That's in six years, I've never seen this before. So we take a look at what happened there. This was the OSB behind the stone. Um, so it met the code, right? And so, but it failed, let's take a look at why. Well, what they did is they had the thin stone. When I, when I ran a Wolfie analysis, I got thrown on analysis, I put thin stone, on their setting bed and they had their idea was they're going to put 15 pound felt paper and then spun bonded polyolefin and that between those two that was going to be their water barrier and this goes back to the days um i don't know in the 50s 60s 70s maybe even 80s in california when they did the stucco they would put two layers of 60 minute paper up and then stucco over it and the thought process was when the stucco cured and dried out, it would shrink a little bit and it would pull one layer of the 60 minute paper away from the other and that would create a drainage space. Well, nobody had really tried that here that I knew of um, because I think everybody here in the Northeast would say that's a horrible idea because we know now that you need at least an eighth of an inch space to drain water and at least a quarter to ventilate that. And that was a study done by a guy named Dr. Don Onisco up in Syracuse. That guy dumped water down wall assemblies for two years. And his, this, that, that was his conclusion. You need an eighth of an, an inch space to drain water, quarter inch to, to ventilate the back of it. So we put this assembly together and then ran it through, through the Woofie program. So again, it 
you know, we're looking at monitor positions two, three, and four are critical ones. We want to see what the, the RH levels were at those. Um, and we're looking at 90% here, monitor position two, um, inside, you know, which is just inside the face of the sheathing. Uh, we look at monitor positions three, which is red, and four. Four is telling us we're hitting 100% relative humidity at that vapor barrier they had there. So they're getting condensation on the exterior face of that vapor barrier. So this is why everything's starting to rot out. So what's the fix? It's actually really simple. If you ever get a cladding system like this, let's go back to what Dr. Don on this said, you just need a quarter inch airspace, right? Right here. So we take our cladding, we, we can do a uh, dimple drain board. Um, I've done um, um, uh, the uh, ge geotextile with the, uh, extruded um, product on the back side of that. Um, anything that'll create that quarter inch space is actually uh, a, a group now uh, that's um, North America, uh, I forget the name of it, um, but they're, they're, they're rain spring cladding group that they're, they're coming up with guidelines. And I think this has to be like 80% open and has to be a quarter of an inch or up in Canada, 20 millimeters. It's actually in the code in Canada now. So all we have to do is put that air layer in. And I spoke with um, two of the developers of the Woofie program. And I said, what do I use for the ventilation here? The ventilation factor. And they said, 15 air changes per hour. We've got all the data for you. They sent it to me. So you run, you put the space in and then have it um, in your sources and sinks, ventilate that. Uh, for 15 air changes per hour. And let's see what happens. Now look at monitor position two. That looks great. You know, it starts at 80 and it just dries right out and it stays dried out. Uh, monitor position three and four, remember four was up at 100% relative humidity, stays below 75% relative humidity. And, and so that's all you need. That's all that building needed. When they rebuilt it, they had to tear all the cladding off. And when they rebuilt it, they put that that um, they back drained and, and back vented that veneer and they haven't had problems with it since then. All right, moving on to the next one. This is our community center. Uh, a friend of mine who um, was um, actually, I used to work at, at your old firm, Sarah, called me up and he goes, can you help my friend Gary Moyer and I on this building? We got to figure out what's going on. Um, I was going to say, it looks familiar. Yeah. It was, it was Neil Rouleau called me in. So um, so they said, can we take a look at this? I said, what's the problem? They said, well, this one addition to the building is only 20 years old, but the roof has already failed three times. And it needs to be replaced again. I was like, can you meet us out there? I was like, okay. So I walked out and I took a look, one look at the addition. I went, all right, what, what's in the building? And they said, oh, that's our competition swimming pool. <laughs> so I knew they, I knew they were in for trouble because they built it just like any other building. So um, some of the other issues were there's all this stainless steel inside the pool, pool building area that was corroding. There was condensation on the windows. In the wintertime, it rained inside the building. The, like the, there'd be people in there like doing uh, water aerobics and there was raining on them. Um, the, 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 they had basically what the building was, was a eight inch split face concrete bearing walls. The exterior, they dropped uh, precast concrete double T's and then filled that top portion of the T with an EVE system. Um, the CMU was all left fluorescent pretty bad. So here's, here's what's going on with the roof. So um, this tells me that there's, you know, they had the XP or the um, poly, uh, poly ISO insulation on the roof. And so of course, fully adhered roof you needed a facer on that. So that facer gets wet at the underside of the roof and the poly ISO expands at the top side, but not so much at the bottom side. And it looks like whales trying to surface underneath the roofing membrane. So um, the, the, the building had met code, but it still failed. And we need to find out why. So we take a look at this, this assembly here. The other thing is when I went in the building, I, I had my, um, my uh, little device there that tells me temperature and relative humidity. And I clicked the button and it was 94% relative humidity inside the building, which is above 90%. You're even going to get the stainless steels to start corroding. And I noticed this one rack was stainless steel and was corroding. I said, yeah, look at this is corroding. And the, built, the people who ran the building said, 
Yeah, all the railings around the pool were corroding too. They were rusting, so we just painted them. <laughs> so we take a look at this. We got a roofing membrane on the top here. Uh, we got the poly ISO with the, with the um, board here. And I didn't put a gap in here between the concrete, the, the top of the precast double T's. But having worked in the industry, and especially with double T's that long, you know the camber is going to vary a little bit from, from um, uh, unit to unit, precast T to precast T. So along the edges, you're not going to have it line up. And then there's probably, since the, the third roof, there's probably three layers of, of adhesive down there, which may have a little gap. But I just wanted to see what would happen if I ran it this way. And I ran it at the really high relative humidity inside. So we take a look at total water content and structure in the, in, in the, in the whole, the whole um, assembly here. And it's going up from year to year to year to year. And that was one of our failure criteria at ASTM, which is now adopted. You know, they, they've taken over the, the, the failure criteria at ASHRAE under standard 160. Um, we look at, you know, our, our, our poly iso cyanurate insulation, look at the water content from year to year to year. It doubles in over a five year period. Um, your concrete, same thing, it's going up year to year to year. So we got to come up with a new way to roof this that's going to take care of all these issues. So um, and yeah, you look at uh, relative humidity in the poly ISO also. Um, so was, and then, was this roof uh, mechanically attached or was it adhered? Fully adhered. Fully okay. adhered poly ISO, fully adhered membrane. Well, wasn't fully adhered poly ISO, they just had um, adhesive strips down on it. So then we look at the interior surface here, the relative humidity we see during the winter months, it's hitting 100% relative humidity. This is why it was raining inside the building on the people trying to exercise in the pool. Uh, Cause that, that concrete was getting cold enough to cool that air there below its relative humidity. So we either bring the temperature of the concrete up some way somehow, or drop the relative humidity in the building some way somehow. My approach was to do both. So, um, my my proposal and this is the eve system you see the 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 um, split face concrete block and then the eaves this was filling in at the precast t's and when you have icicles coming out of the eaves you know you probably got a problem um this is the, the finish on the eaves system this is what they had inside the pool uh beforehand um you can see all, the, all these railings here this is the ones they painted because <laughs> they were rusting the stainless steel railings we had, you know, some moss growing and mold growing on the window systems. Um, this was their ventilation system. Um, this is what, what was designed to change the air out inside that building. Um, and here was their, their, this, here was their dehumidification system. It wasn't doing the job of what was 90%, 94% RH in the building. We brought in an HVAC engineer. And I said, can you get me below 80? If you can get me below 80, I can, we can fix this thing and, the, and it won't happen again. And so we came back to the next meeting and he goes, I can get you down to 55. I wanted to hug the guy. I was like, really? You can really do this with this big open pool of water? He goes, yep, I'll get it down to 55. It's like, okay, let's go. Um, then I looked at the, the, the guy who was one of the, the superintendents of the building. I said, you know, once we do this, you're gonna have to refill the pool a lot more often. He goes, why? I like, go oh, for evaporating it off and draining it down. He goes, well, that's that's a lot less aggravation than what we're dealing with now. So and here was here was inside the precast tees. Look at the studs, how corroded they were already. And you know, when we went up to look at it and just pulled the paper on the interior gypsum wallboard, it just fell off. And you can see this beautiful colors of mold growing inside there. Um, no, this this was a track holding up the Eve system there, and that was all corroded too. So, so of course when when we did rip the roof, um, this is what I wanted to show. You can see down here, the camber on the T's are a little bit different because these are really long span. These are like forty foot long, and so I knew we. And then you look at the different colors of of the adhesives that were down there. So I said, get as much as that adhesive off as you can. And we we what we did was we address the, 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 these areas here was, was, was spray foam ahead of time. But so what we looked at for the fix is I didn't want any, I didn't want any gap between the insulation and, and the top of that precast T. 
So, and I wanted to put a vapor barrier there. So I found a manufacturer. So the only way to do that was make your insulation spray foam, which there are spray foam roofs. They're not the nicest looking roof, but um, they had a bigger problem here. But I wanted an air water and vapor barrier here. And I wanted to do spray foam roof because I didn't want any air spaces. And I didn't want any joints between the insulation either. Because uh, even at 55% relative humidity, that's a lot of moisture drive up there. So we went with a pretty low perm um, air water and vapor barrier material here. And then we went with a high perm roof coating. I think it was like 10 and a half perms. And so we ran, we, we simulated that and ran that. And look what happened now. The total water content was going up every year. Now it's going down every year. Um, we look at our, our polyisocyanurate insulation there. Um, and it, it dries out from the 80% and stays nice and dry. Same thing with the, wa the, the water content in the, in the concrete. And look at our, our monitor positions here. We, we're kind of high in the extruded polystyrene, but that can get wet and it's not gonna corrode. Um, the, the, the R value may go down a little bit, but we compensated by putting, you know, put, or, I'm sorry, this is in the extruded polystyrene. That can get wet and it really doesn't, it has such a you know low moisture absorption content. It's like 0.2% because it is closed cell and the cell structure is really tiny. So I didn't really mind that. When we'll take a look at the um, um, the relative humidity in the spray foam. It comes down from the 80, dries down. Um, you know the interior surface stayed you know the relative humidity right around the 55 that we're keeping at. Uh, so it looked like it all was going to work. So you can see these humps on the roof. We did some spray foam there to, so we could bridge across it with our air water and vapor barrier. We did find a manufacturer of the air water and vapor barrier that also manufactured the spray foam. So we knew there was no compatibility issues there because uh, they had tested it all. So we put that down. Um, here it is with the spray foam going down on top of that. Uh, they're fixing the eaves. We, we, we changed that eave system. Inside, we put cement board only instead of gypsum board. And here we had, we had um, the fiber uh, um, glass mat facing on, on, our, um, on our gypsum sheathing here. But I'm mostly going to stick to the roof here. Uh, and then they're, they're putting the, they're rolling the top coat down. I had them roll the first coat of the roofing membrane on there. Uh, just to get it in all the little nooks, crannies, whatever, the spray foam, because the spray foam is kind of uneven. Then the second coat, they, I, I allowed them to spray that down. So Quick here it is. All was, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt again. Quick question. Was the spray foam bonded to the vapor barrier? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that's why I, I didn't want any gaps or spaces there. And that's why we went with the spray foam. This okay. is the vapor barrier here. Um, you know, it, it, um, and then the spray foam's the yellow and then the, the tops, the, the, what looks black, but it, it dries to a gray. So I just didn't want any spaces or gaps where humid air could get in there. So this is it almost done. Um, you'll notice that crummy little dehumidification system is gone. And this one, the size of a school bus is parked over there now, uh, but it worked. So it came out a lot nicer, and you notice the the efflorescence is is almost gone now on on the on the split face CMU. But this is a size dehumidification system that they had to put in um, to get this thing fixed to get that relative humidity down. And this is what it looks like inside the building now. You know, we get these two huge ducts now, and um, it's a lot drier inside the building. You can see this the see even some of the bottom of the tees that were wet in previous pictures are. They're starting to dry out now. Um, then, you know, we go back every year uh, to just to make sure everything's working well. And, and it's been like three or four years now. So it's looking a lot better, functioning a lot better. And the problems are going. All right. So this is going to be this one. We're going to show you a save that we had. Thank God. Um, I got called into a meeting from this developer that I work for. He goes, I got a new project. I've got to meet at the, at the contractor's office and the architect will be there. And they said, and what he explained was there's an existing um, synagogue with an existing mikvah that's in a house and they're both falling down. They don't have the money. So if I build them a new synagogue and mikvah, they'll tuck it in the corner of the site. And this is right near St. Elizabeth's Hospital. And I get the rest of the site and I can put up an 88 unit apartment building. I was like, oh, great. What's my first question? What's a mikvah? 
well, a mikvah is used in the Jewish religion as a, for like a ritual cleansing. So inside the building, I find out there's going to be three open pools of water. So people go in, they go into the, the bathroom in there, they go in, they take a shower, get clean, they put this robe on, then they meet the whoever it is that, that does it. They walk them down into the submersion pool and they dunk them in the pool. And then they come out and they clean themselves up and leave. So there's going to be three open pools of water in this building. And I said, do you have three open pools of water in the existing house? They said, no, just two. And I said, what's it like in there? Does it smell moldy? He's like, oh God, yeah, it's horrible. It smells terrible in there. And I said, okay, well, you can't build this building the way you want to build it. We got to change it. And some of the things I did learn is you see the, the line of this roof, the water for that, for the immersion pools is collected from rainwater. It has to be pure. So you pitch the roof to a drain and you collect that water and you fill up um, these, these tanks, um, well, it's one tank called, a, called an oitzer, and the water's in there, and they do treat it a little bit to keep it from growing mold and whatnot, but they want it rainwater, they want it pure. So uh, this was a building under construction. So here was their design. They had some, like a stone veneer, uh, or the, they, had, you know, they had some, uh, some um, hardy side, well, I shouldn't say hardy, uh, fiber cement siding, they had a two inch cavity, they did three inches of, of rock wall insulation or mineral wall. Um, they had their, their air and water and vapor barrier on their sheathing. The sheathing was OSB. And then they filled the stud cavity that I see happen a lot. I don't know about you people. Um, I see architects and developers look at it and go, like, geez, I got all that space. Let's fill it with insulation. It'll be better. It'll work better. Well, not always, especially in a high humidity building. Again, um, I asked them, I said, do you have dedicated dehumidification for this building? We got to get the humidity down to three open pools of water. You're going to be pretty high. And they, and again, uh, the, the HVAC engineer came back and he says, yeah, we'll put it in. I'll get you down to 55. It's like, wow, that would be great. But even so, it, it, this design actually met the code. If you go by the letter of the code, it met the code. You know, it had enough insulation, had the air, water and vapor barrier on the winter warm side of the insulation. But if we take a look at this, um, it's we know it's going to fail. Why? So we take that design and we take our, our, our OSB sheathing. This is here, water content. And we see that it shoots up. That's at 80%. It shoots way up from four pounds to six, comes down and back up over four pounds year after year after year. And this is, again, it meets the failure criteria. We developed at ASTM and have turned over to ASHRAE. Um, 160 standard now, the ASHRAE 160 uh, committee. Again, here's our gypsum board inside. You know, it's 0.34 pounds um, water per cubic foot, and it, it shoots up over that every winter. So this building's going to have some problems. You know, we look at monitor position two, that's the inside face of the sheathing. It's up over 90% every winter. Uh, three. So, um, so what is the fix for this one? Well, what we want is the interior temperature and relative humidity to stay the same all the way out to your air and water barrier, air, water, and vapor barrier. We want, if it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be 75 to 76 degrees in there because people are, they, you know, it's 68 in the winter time and they're getting dunked in water and they come out, they're gonna get cold. So they run the place pretty hot, 76, 78 degrees. So we want 76 to 78 degrees all the way to here. And then we'll have a successful building enclosure. So, but, so we had to take the insulation out of the studs in order to make that happen. But the, we, the, the building was already designed. We only had three inches of insulation to use here. I said, if we can go to four and take an inch off that masonry cavity, if we have to, well, they didn't, they already had the, the shop drawings done for the rebar, for the, the foundation walls. So we had a, within that three inches, we had to get the R value they needed. The only thing that worked was spray foam insulation to give us the R value we, that we needed for that assembly. So what we did is we used that as our air, water, vapor barrier, and heat barrier. One material uh, was all four of our barriers, sprayed it right to the sheathing. And we took a look at how that works. So now we look at the, the, um, um, the uh, gypsum board, or the, I'm sorry, the, the um, uh, OSB sheathing here, it starts at four like it did before, but it just dries right out and stays nice and dry. Uh, the, outside, the outside water content of the outside components, I really wasn't that concerned with. 
um, you know, the, the spray foam insulation is, is the, the red here. Uh, and then the, um, the air space is the, is the blue here. And it, it, looked, it looked really good. It looked really promising. And when, then we looked at the RH levels. We start at 80 and, you know, we're, we're, we're not getting above 75%. So that's looking really good. So here's the finished product that was done a few years back, I think two, two years ago. Um, came out really nice. It's been operating for two years. I'm still consulting. I consulted on the synagogue and I'm consulting on the, the, the apartment building that's going up right now. I designed the waterproofing for that because even though it's up on a hill, uh, it was in a filled in granite quarry. So it was a, basically a bowl. So we have a water problem on the site. Um, but I see the woman who runs the mikveh every once in a while. I says, how's it inside? She goes, oh, it's great. It's great. The no more mold smells. She goes, no, no, it's really nice. It's comfortable. So um, she's really happy with it. Here's some pictures of what we did. We took, you know, we, we needed to offset the, the, the stone and then the, the siding. So um, and we couldn't, they had some Z furring in for the siding. So we, we took that out because that's, you know, that thermal bridging is against the, you know, the code now. Um, the code basically got rid of that. So we used this bracket I invented. We put that up. We did the spray foam around the bracket. We screwed the top plate in. Um, then we put hat furring. Uh, screwed that to the top plate so this is you know you can space this at four foot because of the brackets uh, engineered for that and got it all ready for the, the siding and then we put the this fiber cement siding up um, we had to get we did have to get some special screws that could tap through the fiber cement and then tap through the metal but it came out really you know as you saw the picture it came out really nice and we headed off a problem that would have that, that they would have had it would have been you know brand new building it would have been a disaster and the lawsuits would have, would have been flying. So we caught that one on time. So that's about that. Uh, that's about all I have for you. If there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. And I finished just in time, huh? Yeah, right in the nick of time. Thank you, Len. Uh, so yeah, so we do have a couple of questions, I guess, moving backwards in the um, case studies that you talked about. Going back to the community building, we had a question from Richard about how was the vapor barrier secured uh, on the roof? Was it glued? It's adhered. It was, adhered? It was fluid applied. Yeah, it's a fluid applied air, water, and vapor barrier. That's unusual, but it, uh, that, that makes me feel better about it. Yeah. Yep. So they, they rolled it. You can see the rollers over here. They rolled it out, and we're out there making sure we got the, the right thickness. What, pro what product was that? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, BASF's Entertype. Oh. Okay. Um, and then another question. It's, a, it's, an S, it's STPE based, a silo terminating polyether. So it's almost like a sealant. So, okay, Sarah, I'm sorry. One point, sorry, can I just ask a quick follow up there? Yeah. Did you say that you flattened out the roofs, the concrete roof surface before you applied the vapor barrier? Only only at the joints in the T. Can you see these little mounds here? We had an open joint in the T and we're like, how are we gonna fill that in? Um, Cause we can't, this won't, this, this fluid applied is not gonna bridge that gap. So what we did is we, we had this, the spray foam contractor come out. He did the, the, the air water and vapor barrier too. He just did a, a shot of spray foam right at all the joints because it's gonna, that'll allow for movement. This, the, the spray foam insulation will move a little bit will allow for a little bit of movement you know we're looking at like caulking it and certain sealant and backer rod and and we said hey, why don't we just do why don't we just hit it with the spray foam and then we can roll that material over the spray foam too right thanks any other questions about this particular one before i uh we had another one about the um the apartment building Uh, was it the apartment? Sorry, it was the condo. It was the first um, uh, one that you presented where you took the insulation out of the cavity. Yep. Uh, so the question was, how does taking the insulation out of the cavity help the water content? Uh, oh, shit. Well, it changes the location of the dew point. I mean, it's simplistically, 
Thank you, Greta. Um, yes, so now, oh, oh shoot, I'm on the wrong one. All right, so this is the, here's where we want to be. So now if we look at this assembly, inside we have conditions, uh, probably 68 in the, in the winter time, uh, 76 in the summertime, and the relative humidity is probably, since this is a occupied building, it'd probably be 30% in the dead of winter and maybe get up to 55, 60% in the summer. Um, but it'll be that same temperature and relative humidity all the way to here. If we put insulation in here, then the temperature is going to be like 70, 68 here in the wintertime. And we're going to be dropping off because we're stopping the heat transfer with that insulation. And if that's 70 degrees, 30% relative humidity air inside, and we the dew point temperature of that air is, I think, 38 degrees. So if we put insulation in here and right here gets 38 degrees, we cool that below its dew point temperature, that air. And now we're going to get condensation. One of your four wetting potentials will get condensation. The other wetting potential we had was when the detail membrane was falling off because the moisture content of the sheathing got too high. Now, if we put insulation in there and we get condensation forming here, now we're going to get a higher moisture content of that gypsum sheathing. And, um, and that's when the moisture content will get high enough now that that, that membrane is going to start falling off again. So as long as we keep this warm, and at a, at a, a relative humidity that matches the interior, we're not gonna have the problem with the detail membrane falling off that because the moisture content's not gonna get high enough. Okay, thank you. And as Greta pointed out, we push the dew point. The dew point's gonna be where the, the warm meets the cold. So wherever you put your insulation, that's where the theoretical dew point is. So instead of in here now, your theoretical dew point's gonna be out here. So we have another question related to the condo building. Would the rain screen, um, would the rain screen would have worked if there had been drainage space behind the exterior insulation? Behind the exterior insulation. I wouldn't have done that um, because now your insulation won't work if air can flow behind your insulation. If you think about that, if we put a space here and there's air flowing here, then your insulation is doing nothing. Because you're letting that outside air flow behind the rain screen panel and then get behind the insulation if you do put that space there. So no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't in this application, I would, I would, I wouldn't put a, a back vent and back drain system behind your insulation. I put it behind any cladding system, but definitely not behind an insulation layer. I apologize. My computer just died. I hope I didn't kick anyone else out. We're all here. Okay, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, sun and scram. But as I was saying, for the first condo building, uh, would the rain screen would have worked if there'd been a drainage space behind the exterior insulation? So I know that uh, the leaky windows will have still would have drained behind the insulation, but would it still increase the humidity if it was allowed to drain out? Uh, Probably, yeah, because it has adhesive properties too. So it, it will stick to the backside of the insulation. Um, the problem, and, and, and it'll stick to the face of the vapor permeable air bear. They should have flashed it to dump out over the, the outside face of the insulation. Um, but when they put the flashing in, when they made, we're making the flashing pans up and putting them in, the insulation wasn't in yet and it wasn't going to be in yet. And they didn't think this think enough ahead of time to go, maybe we should make sure it comes out and over. They came up with, well, we know it's going to dump down the, the face of the, uh, out, out of the sill flashing pan and down the face of water resistant barrier. We don't want it building up. So that's why they did that. The, um, um, 
the kick out flashing every two floors to try to get the water out. But it just it just wasn't enough. There's too much water that got trapped behind there. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was the last question. Does anybody else have anything else they want to add or comment on? Our, uh, all right, so we have one more from Eric. He said, on slide 42, you have three layers in the wall. Is this just so you can match with the model to the real world monitor position? In slide 42, this is 42. Hmm. Is that? Oh, let's see, Eric, do you mind clarifying your question? Sorry, it was a slide we were looking at a moment ago that uh, uh, showed the um, uh, the wall section in Woofy, and uh, yeah, it, I guess. Or oh, this one. Yeah, that okay. one. That's it. Yeah. So okay. Your we your question was. Yeah. Why um, you've got three. Air layers, fifty millimeters a piece. Oh, um, you can't. You can't. Change, you can't change the thickness of the air layer and Woofy, or it throws the, the 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 calculation off. Thanks so much. So that's it. Comes in, you know. I just grab, um, you know. Th this was now that I, I have Woofy six point three. There's wider air layers, but sometimes they result in an issue. So I just did for the six inch stud space. I just did three two inch. Um, if you, Lynn, if you, yeah, I don't think you can do that. Or you, you, I think you should should do two. There's an air layer on the inside, and there's an air layer on the outside, but you don't get to have a an, another air layer in the middle because there's nothing just, that it's up against. No, this is just to simulate the six inch air cavity. The, yeah, but the, the, a big a bigger cavity isn't better isn't better than a small one over one properties. inch. The properties for, for each layer are the same. And this is something I checked with with Achilles, who you know, and Andre Desjardins. And I don't know if you know Monfred Kerr. He's from Fraunhofer Institute. Um, oh, yeah, you've met him at summer camp. So, yeah, this is how they recommended doing this when, when you have a six-inch space. Because as you know, you know when for Wolfie first came out, the biggest air layer they had was two inches. Um, now, they do have wider ones, but... I, when I try to use a six inch air cavity in Wolfie 6.3 and run the calculation, the, the, the program jams up and, and it won't run. So, but, but the, the, the thickness of an air, depth of an air cavity won't change the, uh, the thermal characteristics. No. The, well, it's Over just air inch. cavity next to air cavity next to air. The, the, yeah, it's only going to change when you have a change of materials. Yeah, so you at each material on either side, you get you get an air layer going up where the air circulates, and you get some thermal resistance from that. And right. you get the same thing on the other side, but in the middle, nothing's happening. There's no more thermal resistance. There's nothing happening hydrothermally, I don't think. But there's still a heat heat transfer, and and I think it showed it. Um, well, we're not going to solve it here, but I don't think you get anything more for for a bigger air cavity so richard you're saying that when woofy models that airspace it's not homogeneous throughout the whole thickness there's yeah. a surface feature at each interface with the next material and so then if you make three of them you've got these interfaces that don't really exist Is yeah that it's implying that there's some material like a film or something yeah. that the air can move against in the middle there but there isn't. No, because it, that all three layers have the exact same properties. No, yeah, but an air layer, the, the air layer, they use, use an air layer on the inside and the outside too, right? The air layer of, the, of an assembly on the outside and the inside. Well, that, that for calculating the, the R value of an assembly, yes, you do. Um, in Woofy, it doesn't have that. All it's measuring is is heat and moisture transfer through the layers. And it's only in 1D. In the only, it, it can't measure um, any air transport of, of heat or moisture. It's, it's steady state, 1D, one dimensional. 
Um, they did add where I, where I showed you in the apartment building where you could put air changes per hour in a ventilated space, but I have no air changes per hour in here, in this space here, so. Well, you probably know more about Woofy than I do right now. Um, I never thought heard of an airspace that you that was any greater than an inch that mattered. Well, this is just to simulate the dead airspace you have in the stud. That's why I needed yeah. this inches. Well, that's a, but you only get our value of one out of a one inch airspace. And that's it. Correct. If you have a six inch airspace, it's still one. Correct. And you don't want much hard value across that space because <laughs> then the temperature is going to drop across that and you don't you don't really want that or you don't want it to drop too much so you'll have a problem yeah. but part of that r value that you get with uh, it has to do with the surface that bounds the air the airspace and so now instead of two surfaces you have six surfaces the but <laughs> but if the, if the materials are similar, so we got a surface here of the, the gypsum board, and we got a surface here, the gypsum sheathing. But these materials have all the exact same properties, so you're not going to have a change of moisture or heat transfer across these layers or, or the what you call the surfaces, because the properties are the same. And I think if you look at the, you know, if you look at the graphs, it, it, it pretty much shows that, you know, um, I wish I could. Well, I'm not sure the effect. Probably run it again and, and put a, you know, monitor position here, monitor position here, put one in the middle, one in the middle here, and let's see what happens at those three monitor positions. I'm prob and I can almost guarantee you they're all, it's going to look the same. You know, um, it's going to be a little colder here, a little warmer here, but, you know, um, like here, monitor position three and four, see how they almost mirror each other. If I had, if I had those monitors, added monitor positions, it would probably be a lot like that. So. Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I wouldn't have thought about that, but I haven't used Woofy except for once. So. For anyone else who's using it, it's a good thing to take in consideration. And also, like Len said, is you know to put those control points uh, while you're doing your simulation to make sure that those you know air barriers or those surfaces uh, don't actually affect your calculation. And that's a good way to determine, I guess, if you do out um, if it does or not. Yeah, and I've done oh god, I've done well over a thousand of these, and since I got certified in two thousand and four. And then I did the advanced and stumped Andre <laughs> at the advanced. <laughs> well, we don't have any other questions. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks, uh, we had quite a few comments saying thank you for the presentation uh, and sharing us your story. And for those of you who are still with us, um, I did repost the link if you want to receive AA credits to fill out that form and we'll follow up and send an email. Also, I highly recommend you join our LinkedIn group. Uh, also, this presentation is recorded, so it will be on the BSA Boston Beck website probably in a week or two. So thank you, everyone. And thanks again, Len. We really appreciate it. Have a good night. Thanks. Good night, good night everybody. And uh, Len, just to let you know, uh, a few members of the board are going to stay on because I have a question about next month's presentation. Okay. I'm just about to hit leave meetings. So. Okay. Did you Bye -bye. send me invites to the meetings? I, I know I'm registered. Thanks, Len. In invites. Sure. My pleasure. Thanks, Len. Great presentation. Thanks. As I'm usual. Sorry, your question. What do you say? Um, can can you send can you put me on the invite list of the Beck meetings because I, I was signed up for it and um, I just all of a sudden I stopped getting them and I went on to the the uh, BSA website and I'm still like the checkbox says subscribe and I so I called and they said uncheck yourself and then the next day check yourself and you know put the check in again 
and see if that works. And it hasn't. So I haven't been getting invited to these. I haven't been invited either. <laughs> I have to, I have to like remind them. I have to like go in every month. I have to look and see what's going on and then go in there and register. And, you know, like, I, I just don't think that system is working at all anymore. I love <laughs> You know, we'll just be LinkedIn friends, and then I'll send you the notifications every month. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> the, um, I don't, I'm not sure I get specific invitations either, but I get, I'm on an email list for building, uh, for knowledge communities at BSA, and they right. will list, you know, six different things that are coming up. You can click on the Beck meeting, and that takes you to registration. But the reason I was late joining today is for some reason my registration never worked. So I, yeah, my, mine didn't either. So I had to scramble for a Zoom link. Oh so no! Okay, that's why I, Susan Green Susan <laughs> responded to my plea. But um, so I don't know. And actually, um, when Neil reached out to me, um, you know, he used to work at GRLA saying that he had difficulty registering so i got him in touch with susan but i didn't see him on today's presentation so i don't think he ever figured it out that no, so I, yeah he wasn't i, I looked yeah. through the list i saw a bunch of old friends peter greta rick uh, scott winkler um there's a bunch of old friends i saw in there but yeah well you should come to these more often we should invite you more often too <laughs> I've been yeah, i'll make it a point <laughs> I'm trying, but. So, maybe maybe the LinkedIn page is a good solution um, because I tried finding it on the BSA website and it, yeah, anyway. Um, Len, before you leave, do you mind stop sharing so I can share my screen? Oh, geez, I'm sorry. Uh, That's okay. Uh, more screen sharing, what do I have to do? New share. Um, options how do i do that oh um, I, I gotta i gotta get a powerpoint right yeah if, you, if sometimes if you have a no yeah on full screen it won't here we go oh there we Wait. go yeah. all right you got it all, all right, right. Yeah. my desktop okay. i'll share no i'm gone you're good yeah. all right Thanks, everybody. I hope Thank All right. Thanks, Len. Thanks, Len. Thanks a lot, Len. See you soon. Okay, we're still on. Sign and leave. Oh, Sarah. I got to sign and leave. All right. Sign. <laughs> Just can't get away. Hey, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I'll make it really quick. I'm sorry um, for having this impromptu meeting. But I did reach out to Josh. Uh, he wasn't able to attend tonight, obviously, but he got back to me with a few um, answers. So I asked him if your presentation will identify how the topic and content are relative are relevant to building enclosures. And his response was, so all material has embodied carbon. The simple act of making products release greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and warms up our planet. So we could be talking about candy bars, cars, building envelopes, and embodied carbon slash greenhouse gases is relevant. So my presentation will let folks know how to find products that are part of the building enclosure, which are lower in embodied carbon. And okay. Then, That's just what I want to know. No, it, that, well, go ahead, <laughs> you, the whole thing, but he did, that's not what, I'm the one who found him as a speaker. And I asked him to address life cycle analysis because I'm tired of this so-called carbon, the embodied carbon as the sole reason for selecting materials. And I thought a life cycle analysis would incorporate many other things like how does it perform and also other things about its manufacture. Does it use a lot of water? Does it cause pollution and so on? Because the life cycle analysis is much bigger than embodied carbon so-called. Which was and, invented by the oil companies. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, um, the okay. problem is he, I, I wrote to him um, just a bit ago and I said, originally we, what I asked was to talk about life cycle analysis. And he says, well, the problem is nobody does 
life cycle analysis for, for building enclosures. They only do it for the whole building or for the materials. And so, um, so he never said that before. Um, but I think it, it still could be a useful presentation um, if he talks, it's okay to talk about greenhouse gas emissions or so-called embodied carbon, but what is the big picture? I, I thought he was gonna be able to put that into a big picture of this is how the whole building performs and that's one piece of it. But anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. And just to kind of preface, or you know, like why we wanted this for a September or February is because at the time when we were having this conversation, we were still trying to work out like a hybrid um, meeting. So we're like, oh, you know, we'll have Josh do full, go in for February, and then after that, we can reach out to you know Matt or Lori to see if we can start the hybrid then rather than starting the hybrid and like going back and forth, which I guess is another topic um, that we can talk about because I don't no, I don't know about everyone, but my company just like went back three steps with like mandating masks because after the holiday, like Omicron or whatever robot name <laughs> is going around, um, really affected our job sites. So I personally would not like to do in person, but um, we can kind of defer that. I think it's an easy thing we can put up like on a poll, um, but kind of going back to this presentation, you know, it does seem like it's a good presentation, uh, but you know, like Greta said, is we don't want to focus on, you know, just embodied carbon and selecting materials because of this. And that's something, you know, maybe Greta, we can hop on a call with Josh tomorrow to clarify uh, what he plans on talking about and like relating it a little bit more to our industry, rather than you know, like we said, just pushing for embodied carbon, but not understanding the life cycle of it. Does he have like a slide deck he can share to maybe help alleviate some of these concerns? Uh, I can ask him. I don't have anything available. I shared everything that we, that he gave me. Or me yeah, I, I just meant as it might be one way to make people comfortable with the content and whatnot. That's true. Uh, so, that kind of leads me to the, my next concern is, you know, we will have to decide whether we want him to present or perhaps he can tailor his presentation to suit our industry needs a little bit more. But if we don't want to select him for February, then I, I need to reach out to Matt because I didn't confirm with him if he wanted to present yet because we were still like debating. Um, well, I I don't know, Josh. He came recommended by someone who I sort of know slightly. Um, and it could be an interesting topic, but, um, you know, maybe, I'm not sure how to, in his four learning objectives, he mentions life cycle analysis. So I, maybe he's mm -hmm. doing that for the individual materials, not the same. Maybe I shouldn't, you know, maybe what he can talk about is life cycle analysis of brick, of gypsum sheathing, of seal studs, and all those things. I, I would echo Greta's point that if we can, he's talking about all uh, building construction materials in his first response, and then only if in the last sentence, does he say, well, he could talk about focus on just uh, materials of the building envelope. Well, uh, let's ask him more pointedly, can he yeah. just focus on building envelope materials? Brick, pre precast concrete panels, uh, brick, terracotta, um, you know, terracotta panels, um, glass and aluminum for curtain wall. Um, but, and also focus not just on the so-called embodied carbon, but all the environmental impacts. Yeah. I, I yeah. think so that we would see just, embodied carbon. I mean, there, there are many, you know, this whole mass timber thing um, 
Anyway, sorry, Rick, go ahead. I'm just repeating myself. I wasn't going to say anything, but but I was want to hear what you want to say about the whole mass timber thing. Yeah, um, come into it. So in our in our last meeting, we had discussed, you know, as, as Greta is getting out here, you know, more than just the embodied carbon, but EPDs. And, you know, I know he touched on a few things in what you had uh, sent over earlier today. You know, if he's going to talk about PCRs, you know, is that something we're interested in? You know, I've been working with, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Sustainable Minds, just trying to vet them as a potential source for this sort of, uh, you know, EPD and PCR information. Um, but anyway, th that was with the idea that this would be a presentation that was a little later. And now I think we're trying to sort of adapt this into that presentation or push it up. So I think that's sort of creating some of the questions here, but um, I'm not sure what's the best way to handle it. So let's see, a couple of options and I'm just throwing this out there for your opinion. So we can talk to Josh, see if he can, you know, supply us or, you know, send us um, his slides but ultimately decide to push his presentation off because you know, we wanna combine it with another presentation that we haven't solidified yet. Uh, and then in the meantime, I can reach out to Matt like I was originally going to do and see if he can present. Uh, and I can do that tomorrow, I'll call him, because I know that you know, we've talked in the past and I think he was ready to present for November. So I don't think that it's gonna be that big of a deal for, uh, he already has a presentation put together. Uh, so that way we can still stay our course. We won't really deviate it and it can give us time and also Josh time to see if he can one, tweak his presentation a little bit. Um, and then also Ryan, if you wanna reach out to any contacts at Sustainable Minds, then we can have those two presentations closer together. Uh, yeah, they. I have been working with them. They have offered to make a presentation. I'm just still in the process of kind of vetting, yeah. you know, if, if they're so a good go. fit. And if they are, good. then I'll, I'll circulate it off to the rest of the review as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Sarah, I, I would just confirm with Matt before you cancel Josh. Order of operations. Yeah. All right, I like it. I, I Thank also, you. Good reminder, what was Matt Carlson going to present on? Uh, on commissioning. Yes. Um, but I just I I'm just looking at what what Josh submitted for learning objectives to and he said attendees will understand what a life cycle analysis is, how those data fit with an EPD, and discern between scope one, two, and three greenhouse gas, and then where EPDs, LCAs, and greenhouse gas accounting can be used in the marketplace. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, he doesn't mention building enclosure anywhere. I think that was a good question is like, are you going to <clears throat> focus on building enclosure or are you just... <clears throat> so if you want to, yeah. I can see that having his presentation close to this other one about <clears throat> EPDs. Um, but I think in every case, it, we need to make sure that we, re, that we have people that help people design and build enclosures that perform. I mean, that keep water out, that, that may manage heat and, and control airflow. And that that is, and that if they're, if they're nice environmentally, that's worth knowing about, but that that shouldn't be the, I don't know, it has to be seen in the perspective. And, mm -hmm. but that's, I'm sorry, that's just my opinion. If everyone disagrees with me, then, um, then, then that's. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I agree with you that, you know, who we select should tailor their presentation uh, to our industry, like specific yeah. products and materials, uh, which isn't really clear. I guess I was just making the assumption based off of, you know, his background, um, but, you know, we shouldn't assume. So there's definitely a few things to clarify with him before I reach out to Matt. And just kind of summarizing what we talked about. So asking for slides. 
and then asking him to focus on building materials like brick, terracotta, glass, uh, and then also I would like to see, you know, in conversation with him and perhaps like looking at his slides will help is, is he gonna go over the big picture? Because what I was thinking is, you know, how he's gonna go over what all the acronyms mean. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh great, this is a good introduction to one that perhaps could be more in depth mm -hmm. with another topic about, you know, how to use LCAs and EPDs. But at that point, everyone's gonna know yeah. what the acronyms so mean so they're not completely lost. Uh, kind of like a stepping stone into something a little bit more comprehensive. So I can ask him about, you know, how comprehensive he's going to get into, you know, touching upon all these acronyms and like other environmental considerations, like you mentioned, Greta. Yeah. And then, so the, we'll make a decision this week. I'll gather all that information. So expect a, a poll, email. I'll have like high importance on it and you guys can give your feedback. Uh, and then from there, I will also reach out. I'll give it two days before I reach out to Matt um, to see if he wants to present because hopefully in that time we can decide whether we want Josh to or if we don't want to. Uh, and then that also kind of leads into the next question I have is if we do select Josh, you know, do we want, who do we want to have next? Um, and perhaps, you know, since like it won't matter if we do the half virtual or half in person, uh, if we decide to move Josh to another time, like a couple months from now. Um, so I'm not going to take that into consideration anymore uh, if we don't want Josh to present now and then who do we want to present next? Because if we don't have a contact from Ryan to kind of follow up with Josh's presentation, um, you know, is that gonna kind of hinder the flow of our presentation? Well, for, for what it's worth, I can I can circulate my correspondence with Sustainable Minds today, so you guys can look into them yourselves. I just haven't gotten to the point where I'm totally convinced they're a good fit. Honestly, for very similar reasons to what we're talking about with Josh, I just want to make sure that it's you know going to check all the boxes for us here. But I think at first glance it looks good. They're very involved in the product category rules, and that's the first step towards even being able to do an EPD for any particular material. So I think they could at least shed some light mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. Okay. So do you think that I should ask Matt if he wants to present for February tomorrow? And then depending on, you know, what he says, we can take it from there, whether we want to keep Josh. I mean, I don't really want to, you know, have Josh present just because we don't like have anyone else. His presentation is probably better than we're assuming. I, th I think we're just all a little bit unclear. So Okay. Thanks, Ryan. That makes me feel better. <laughs> I'm like, oh. <laughs> it's, it's probably pretty good. I just, we're, we have a few questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think what, I mean, what Luke and, and uh, Richard emphasized was, can you get to the building enclosure, which yeah. didn't apparent. But I think that was the first red flag. I I do think it's really important, Greta, that even when we get into sustainability and all these other, you know, important save the world issues, it's always through the, the lens of, of building science and building performance. Yeah. I do like the idea of having Matt go sooner than later, just so they know that didn't he originally apply for the symposium and we you know, pushed him down and then November and then we kind of pushed him further down the line and then early February. So, I mean, we, we shouldn't push him just again and again and again. Oh, right, that's, that's, not true. that's not true of Josh. Um, I think no, but of Matt. So he did oh, yeah. uh, apply for the symposium. We did for November. And then I said, I'll reach out to you in like the springtime. So I haven't reached mm -hmm. out to him since because yeah. Josh was brought up. So I guess if I do reach out to him, then and he says, like, yes, then mm -hmm. he should definitely be for February. Okay. That sounds good. I think I, I hear what Steve is saying. <laughs> it's <laughs> worth considering. 
Okay, so I'll reach out to Matt, see if he's interested in February. And then in the meantime, tomorrow I'll also call Josh to get more insight about his presentation. Mm -hmm. And if Matt says yes, Matt will present for February and then we'll push, you know, Josh off. Um, I'll leave the conversation open-ended saying we're also looking to pair this with another pre uh, presentation. You know, what month are you available? Uh, and we'll kind of take it from there. And then, um, you know, after I hear back from Matt, of course, if he says no, then we'll still have additional information from Josh and hopefully he can tailor his presentation a little bit more towards, uh, you know, building and closure performance, which from his background, I'm hoping he doesn't have a problem doing that. And he also has plenty of time to do it. So I think that puts us in a good place either way. Sounds good. Okay, sounds good. And then um, because of this, I would like to have a meeting at the end of February. So that way we can plan out the next three and um, hopefully Ryan with your contact information, you know, depending on where this goes, we'll plan out the next couple of meetings. All right, looks promising, thanks. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Appreciate your time. Thanks. Bye. Sarah, how will we get um, dates for the, uh, the next meetings? Uh, will you so, send us an email? Yes, I will. Okay. I can send a calendar invite if that works. I mean, it, it'll be a placeholder because I won't have the Zoom call until um, I set up the meeting. So it's always the fourth Monday except this month for some reason we did it today, which is the fifth Monday. But in February, you run out of Mondays, so it'll be the 28th. Yeah. And I apologize. I I always assumed it was always the last Monday, not the fourth. Uh, oh. So that's why it wasn't last week and why it was this week. Okay. okay so the next meeting will be on the 28th. And then we'll also have a board meeting after that. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Great. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Hey, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.